Well, good morning again. What a wonderful uh, worship time that was this morning, just to be praising the Lord and giving thanks. I want to say happy Mother's Day to all the moms. Happy Mother's Day to those of you online that are watching. It's uh, always kind of a fun weekend, and uh, at least in our house. So hope that you have a good time. This is also a holiday season that we're in right now. Uh, does anybody know what holiday season we're in? The Feast of Weeks. That's right. The Feast of Weeks. We are on the fourth Sabbath. So the Bible says that we should count seven Sabbaths to the morrow after the Sabbath, beginning on the Feast of First Fruits, where we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus, right? Christ, the first fruits, has risen from the dead, become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Right? And counting 50 days to Pentecost. So there are seven Sabbaths to the morrow after the seventh Sabbath. And so we'll be celebrating the Feast of Pentecost. But this Feast of Weeks is a great time. And we continue on the messages that we've been talking about for this season. And if you'll turn with me to Psalm chapter 34. Psalms chapter 34. And if you're just joining us for the first time, we're going to be picking up actually on a series of sermons I've been giving over the last four weeks in regard to this new life. We were just seeing. The resurrected king is resurrecting me. And the power and newness of life that we have in Jesus Christ is power to go forth with him, being armed with the weaponry, being armed with the armor of God to go forward into battle against sin, society, ourselves. The things that happen with this life and the things that come against us. And basically, we are coming back to the point where we have given authority to Christ when we confess the name of Jesus, when we believed in the resurrection of the dead. And now we live in that power, the power of our king, overcoming sin and overcoming flesh. For as he lives in us, we have the hope of glory. Christ in you is the hope of glory. And notice with me here in Psalms chapter 34. Psalm chapter 34, it says this in verse 17. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. And saves such as have a contrite spirit. And so our walk in the Lord and our nearness is to remember the very true need that we have for him in everything. He is God. He is just and the justifier of one who has faith in Jesus. And the relationship that we have, the walk that we have with our Father in heaven is a walk where we are leaving behind the things of this world. As it says in Romans 6, sin shall no longer have dominion over you. And so we've been talking about what if sin does continue to have dominion? What if we see that sin is still reigning in our lives after we've confessed Christ? And we talked about some of the things that, that go into healing of the broken hearts, that this is a spiritual ministry. This is a ministry that happens by Jesus Christ healing us, as he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, right? To preach good news, to heal the brokenhearted, to set free those who are oppressed, let the captives go. But we see that there are things in our hearts, and there are so many more that we could add so many things to this list. But I ask you to consider, are these things in you? And as we continue to look at these, these things, are there things where we're trying to be people pleasers, where we find ourselves easily hurt, easily offended, where we find our lives are not whole and sound in Christ, but we're still dealing with so much of the brokenness of the flesh and the brokenness that is within because of sin. Where lawlessness abounds, love grows cold. And ultimately, where God is taking us is to give us a, a new heart by which we walk in his ways and we follow him where we walk not in a spirit of pride or conceit, but in humility before him, and we say, what is it that you want me to do? How do you want me to walk and live in my life? We have a wonderful creator God who deserves our loyalty. We talked about how God gave Adam and Eve every reason to obey, every reason to trust. There was nothing in God's actions that would have said, question mark. He gave them life. He invited them in. He let them have dominion over his creation. He let Adam name the animals. When he saw Adam was alone, he created a wife. 
everything about what he did, putting him in the garden, saying, you can eat of all of it. It's all yours. Ten and keep. It all said, I love you. I'm behind you. I want you to be blessed in your life. And yet it was the serpent that deceived, who had no credibility, yet credibility was given. And so as Christians, what we must realize is there has been too much credibility given to this world. There's too much credibility given to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. There's too much credibility been given to things that don't lead to life. When the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ is before us, and he's saying, follow me, walk with me, live with me. And so all of what he is doing is bringing us back to understand his ways. I want us to understand this, that Israel knew salvation. They were all redeemed from Egypt. They all drank of that spiritual drink. They all ate of that spiritual food, as it says in 1 Corinthians 10. But with them, God was not pleased. They knew salvation. They knew deliverance. They saw works. But they didn't know his ways. His ways. And the Reality of the leading of the Holy Spirit in our lives is to teach us his ways, that we would walk in his ways, that we would think like our God, that we would have fellowship with him, that we would be joined together, that the way is a walk in the spirit. And what does it say? If we walk in the spirit, we shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. This is the power of Galatians 5. This is the power of the new covenant of a fellowship with Jesus Christ apart from sin. God does not want us to continue under sin. But as he said in 1 John, he says what? In 2, 1, I write these things that you may not sin. But if you sin, we have an advocate, Jesus the Christ, who is faithful. So this is part of our walk with him. We are learning to wage war with Christ by the power of Christ, not by power or might of our own, but by his spirit and he in us is changing us. The resurrected king is resurrecting me. He's transforming us from glory to glory into the very image. And so we looked at some steps the last time I spoke about healing a broken heart. If you're finding that you're battling, but you're not overcoming, go back to things that might be open in your life where there are critical decisions that haven't been lived out. See, this seems really simple, doesn't it? Humble yourself before God and submit to his authority in your life. Easy to agree to? Yes. Easy to live? Not as much, right? Not as much. But understand, this is not just about having the pat answer. This is not just about saying we know what we should do. The reality to overcoming in life is to say this is the way of the Lord. This is truth demonstrated in the life of Christ. I, too. Jesus said, I can do nothing apart from the Father. He said, I can do nothing. Who would we be to think that we can do anything apart from God? The reality is that Jesus submitted to the will of his Father. He wants us to submit to the will of the Father. He sees the way to go, and he shows us the way to go. And so these things are simple, but in order for us to be successful in the way that we walk with the Lord, it comes down to, do we believe? So when we go into the word, do we go into it to say, well, this is what I think, and I can find verses to prove it? Because I guarantee you, no matter what you want to believe, you can find it. There's over 31,000 verses here by which to use to do it. And I can hear all kinds of manner of craziness. The thing is, when we go into the word, what we want to do is listen for the authority of God. What is God saying Listen to his voice. What is God saying? Why would he be saying this? See, when when we look at this in the purity of heart that God wants us to, this is a beautiful letter. God breathed through all these different instruments, these vessels of flesh that wrote down the word of God. And when we go into the word of God, we should go in with a very simple heart. God, speak to me what you want me to hear. It's and, and, And realize there's going to be things that you say, yes, amen, oh yeah, I agree with. But there's also going to be things you're going to say, mm, I don't know about that. I don't know if I'm living by that. 
And that conviction that comes by the Spirit and the Word is so powerful if we embrace it and don't run from it, that we allow God to speak. So when he says, love your enemies, in the flesh, we like, that's not natural. The first thing we want to do is hate our enemies. But see, God is bringing us to a different way. And ultimately, there cannot be healing in the heart if there's not a submission to the authority of God. Because what was rejected in the beginning in the garden was it was either the authority of God or the authority of self-evaluation. What Satan tempted was to look. You won't surely die. Basically, God's trying to withhold good from you. You can't trust him. And everything we're doing in life is coming back to a trust to say, I don't see it, but I'll follow. I don't know if I should be giving God a tenth of what I take in increase, but I'm going to do it because I believe in him. I believe he'll make it good. I believe he'll make it right. I don't know what this is about loving your enemies or praying for those who spitefully use you, but I'm going to do it because God said to do it. And the thing is, we might take authority and say, that's not what I'm going to do. But see, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where the reality of choice. And friends, don't think that you don't have the power to make that decision. God freed you that you would know the truth, that the truth would set you free, that you would no longer be slaves of sin held by dominion of it, but you would walk in the grace of the Lord. Amen. This is what the grace of God teaches us. It says in Titus 2, the grace of God teaches us denying ungodliness. We would live soberly, righteously and godly in this present age. That's what the grace is teaching. If the grace isn't teaching us that, we need to evaluate, is that what grace is teaching? Grace is teaching us. It's leading us to God because he wants us to know his ways. He is not interested in just keeping us conscious for eternity. He is interested in sharing life with us for eternity. So his ways, his authority. Next Confess your sins and turn from them. We talked last time about the belief of accepting the forgiveness of God. How have you done over the last two weeks since we talked about that? Those of you who said, I have trouble forgiving myself. In other words, I have trouble allowing Christ to cleanse me from my iniquity. Because ultimately the faith required to forgive yourself is found in believing the sacrifice of Jesus was enough for your sins. The salvation that comes, the freedom that comes. But friends, if we continue to brace, embrace our own sin and allow sin to, to still impact our thinking, our ways, our walk, it's still broken. We need to allow for the healing of Jesus Christ. So I won't spend more time on that since we, we gave a sermon to it. But today, let's talk about this. Forgive others and do not hold any debt against anyone. One of the biggest ways to be healed and allow the work of Christ in our lives is through forgiveness. Turn with me over to uh, Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. And if you need a Bible and don't have one, there's, there's Bibles under the seats in front of you if you'd like to turn along with us. Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. Notice here as Jesus is going through this trial at the end of his life, I want you to remember as we read these verses... Jesus knew that he was going to be betrayed by one of his own 12 disciples, one of the ones who was there when he washed feet, one of the ones that he had sent forth with the gospel, one of the ones he had given power. He knew that his own betrayer was at his table that night. He also knew, as what happened, all the disciples that night fled him. Remember, Peter chopped the ear off. He went, he went the road of violence, and Jesus said, no, that's not the way this is working. But when that happened, it said all his disciples left him. He was alone. And it was only Peter who made his way back. And what happened with Peter? He denied him. The strongest, you could say, 
the most bold, denied him three times, said he never knew him. So he has all of this going on. He knew who he was and where he had come from, where he was heading to. And he was being taken, he was being betrayed, he was being beaten. None of his disciples stayed even with him when he prayed. And what did he pray? Father, all things are possible with you. If it is possible, remove this cup from me. Not my will, but yours be done. So we get to see right into the mind of Jesus Christ. And then we come to this crucifixion and notice Jesus' heart and attitude. Verse 33, and when they had come to the place called Calvary. This is Luke again, 23, 33. There they crucified him, and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots, and the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with them sneered, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him coming and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. So when you think about what Jesus is going through in this moment, not only knowing who he was as the one who made all things, who came to earth, not only the one who was going through this and saying, Father, remove this cup from me if it's possible, but going through it and feeling the pain of being beaten and scourged, and now crucified. And here are all these people mocking you, making fun of you, as you're writhing in pain. See, this is the height of what tribulation is, to to be in excruciating pain, and rather than the flesh coming out in ways of darkness, in ways of retaliation, in ways of vengeance, What was coming out? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The heart of Jesus Christ is so profound because when we realize this and really try to meditate and think about what Jesus was going through in these words, it's not just some trite saying that he said, Father, forgive them. The depth of what he was saying to intercede on behalf of those who were killing him, who were being cruel, who were being unrighteousness, who were mocking and sneering, who were making fun of his pain. He just knew they just didn't know. This is the heart of our Lord. How is it when you go through pain? You see, the things that we've been called to in Christ is to be like Christ. And friends, There are all kinds of things that happen in life that create pain. Divorce, death, murders, thievery, loss, having our character smeared, being sued. There are all kinds of things that can happen in our lives that bring about pain. And ultimately, Christ is showing us that there must be a release, there must be forgiveness they weren't even asking for it but he was praying for it how is our heart when it comes to forgiveness see last time we were talking about the forgiveness that we receive from God and believing in that forgiveness to accept that we were worthy of death to judge ourselves as needing a savior because we were going to die the judgment that was coming on us was death the wages of sin is death and we said i need a savior to give me life and in our belief we passed from death to life it says we do not come into judgment we judged ourselves as needing him and he became the answer and the salvation that we all need And it is that mercy and forgiveness that covers so much. That grace that is given that is so important to our own heart to know David. Or you say to yourself, Brandon, Scott, Luke, Greg, you've been forgiven. I've been forgiven. 
to know that he does not deal with me according to my sins. But in his own righteousness, he imputes righteousness to me. That my standing before him is certain. That I am holy and accepted in the beloved. That confidence the Holy Spirit gives us when we truly believe. And we become the children of God and say, your authority, your way, not mine. It heals what's going on inside. And we accept our new identity as one who is Christ's, called by him, chosen for him, to be kings and priests with him. By the blood of the lamb, we have been made separate and holy. And now having this treasure, having this treasure in earthen vessels that God has poured out upon us, he's saying, forgive others. Turn, turn with me over to Matthew chapter 18. In the power of this, to deliver us from iniquity. And friends, we can talk about it, we can preach it, but it is the practice of this in reality that makes the difference. This is not about knowing. There is nothing profound that you're going to hear in the message in the sense that this is new information. The profoundness is when it's believed in our own hearts and minds by the power of the Holy Spirit of Jesus in us where we change. The transformation is by belief. How do we overcome the world? 1 John chapter 5, 1 through 4. Faith. By our faith. It is believing in him and knowing the work that he does. When we think about the instructions of God, these aren't just rules that he's laying out. He's saying this is the way. This is the way of God. And ultimately, if we will not accept the way of God, if we will not practice the way of God, friends, we must be honest and say, I'm not living the way of God. And the brokenness that remains will remain, as, as we will see. Notice this in Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 21. It says, so Peter came up to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Because we can get tired of it, right? You keep doing the same thing. How many times do you forgive? Jesus said, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. I just want you to think about that. The kingdom of heaven is like a king. It's like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. That's a... That's part of the gospel of the kingdom. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had and that payment be made. Well, wow, now why would he do that? Why would he command that they all be paid? What is 10,000 talents? It's a lot. What is a talent? A talent is about 75 pounds of gold. It's about 75 pounds of gold. Do you know what an ounce of gold costs today? This week is about $1,231 an ounce. An ounce. So you multiply that by 16, you multiply that by 75. One talent is worth about $1.48 million. He owed 10,000 of these about $14.8 billion. Was it a debt that was repayable? No. Nope. It was an unrepayable debt. So when he says, take the man, take his wife, take his kids, take everything he's got, you see, that's what the debt of sin takes. Everything that was to be yours goes the other way. See, the inheritance that God wants to give us is one of blessing. But what sin does is totally destroy and puts us in a place of debt. It puts us in a place where we don't want to be. So what it happened with the servant and the king? So the servant fell before him. 
fell down and said, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. The master of that servant was moved with compassion. Released him and forgave him the debt. Friends, Jesus said that he who is unwilling to take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. The life that we give is the life that we give of ourselves to be living sacrifices, presenting ourselves daily to God, proving what is his good and perfect and acceptable will that we live by it. And so this king, this glorious king of ours, moved with compassion when we come and ask for redemption, release. When we offer ourselves to him and say, we don't want the ways of this world, we want your ways. Forgive me my iniquity and my sin. Cause my heart to know you. And this master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt. He forgave it. What was not payable, he forgave. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. And when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. And his master, after he called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So the reality of the torture, the reality of being in a place of sin, you realize as Jesus was leading us and teaching us how to pray, the one thing that was conditional was he said, Father, forgive me my debts as I forgive my debtors. It was conditioned. And Jesus followed up by saying, know this truly. If you forgive others their debts, your Father will forgive you. If you don't forgive others their debts, neither will your Father forgive you. This is one of the things that keeps us in a place of brokenness in life. Because what it does is it empowers the sin to have impact and manipulation in the way that we think about somebody else. See, what happens when we hold on to sin is we start to treat people according to their sins. You owe me. You owe me. We take the position of master over a servant. You owe me something. And now I treat you with the disrespect that you are worthy of because you owe me. And we take the position of Lord over another every time we come into this. It is always the relationship between those who lend and those who borrow. And when we are in a place of debt, we, in holding a person in a place of debt, we have the control. So the issue here is what is forgiveness? Are you requiring something of somebody else for what they have done? Do we treat them according to their iniquity and their sin? See, this is the question that we have to ask in our lives because it says here that my father will do this to each of you if from your heart you do not forgive your brother your trespasses, if from your heart. See, that is the key in what we're talking about and that is from the heart in the way that you think and treat somebody else. 
And it is the sign that we can all look to as Christians to say, have I really done it? Have I just said, you're forgiven? Have I just said, don't worry about it, no problem? Or am I living like it's true? The, the answer is found in, is there a refreshment of your view toward the person who sinned against you? Is it refreshed? See, we can read about David's sin when he sinned with Bathsheba, with what he did with Uriah. We can read about what happened. But when God forgave him, he did not deal with him from that point forward according to his sin. It didn't mean he forgot what happened, but he stopped treating him as a sinner. Forgiveness is to stop treating somebody as a sinner. But here's what happens. Just as Jesus was going through the intensity of the trial on the cross, what happens in our relationships is that if we haven't forgiven from the heart, we start to get in a heated dispute maybe with that person. Maybe we're having some strife in a marriage relationship, in a parent-child relationship, siblings, neighbors, co-workers. And you know what starts to happen? We get upset, and what happens? Here comes that sin again. And we start listing off the wrongs that they've done. Anybody ever have that happen? Either out of your own mouth or heard it from anybody else? There's like this whole record of wrongs. I can go back in the legal record and I can list for you your wrongs against me over the last 12 months, right? You feel like, is, what's the statute of limitations on this? You know, when do I get free of that? Is it, does it ever fall out of the book? And I'll tell you, the reality is that for many of us, it never seems to fall off the books. If you're bringing up what your spouse did 20 years ago, Think about what you're doing. At what point does it fall off the books? But I would ask you this. How are you going to have success in your relationship if you're still treating them according to their sins? If you're trying to make them jump through a hoop to please you. If, if they're always in your eyes the debtor. They owe you. And what you end up doing is torturing your own soul because how can you love when you're viewing them as somebody who's a sinner who owes you something? Here's what you're allowed to do when it comes to debt. Owe no man anything but to love one another. See, the healing that comes, comes because you don't owe me anything. I owe you. That is the position where love flows forward. But when we don't forgive others, we are taking of this beautiful grace that God has given us, and we're saying, I don't want to share it with you. The way of the Lord. Grace is to let it go. And the more intimate the relationship you have, if you are a person who tends toward judgment and fault-finding and critique, you will continue to develop a list by which you treat people and you won't even know the contempt that comes out of your heart and mouth because you're just holding a list and record of wrongs and it prevents love from coming out. Friends, God promised us this, that if we would not forgive, he would not forgive us. How powerful is that in your heart and mind here today to say, I would be foolish to not forgive. And we would be foolish. We would be, like this king said, wicked servant. Friends, we are given this truth of God so that we can make the changes today. If you're holding on to sin, maybe today's the day you finally let it go. My father left my house when I was, was nine years old. My father and I were reconciled at the end of his life, and I want to tell you that up front. My father came to the Lord in a profound way, but when he left our house, it was so painful because I didn't know why he was leaving. I was nine. My sister was 13. My mom, my grandma, we needed dad. And I never could deal with it. All I knew, I, all I knew was pain. This, this, this man that I trusted, that I looked up to, that I, I, I just loved. It was my dad. 
He was respectable in business. He was an elder at the church. He was leaving. That pain stuck. And I can look back in my life and say, man, was I a victim of sin. Because I didn't know what to do with it. It wasn't like counseling in those days. You just kind of suck it up. But I'll tell you, I was not the kind to suck it up. I was broken. I was hurt. And all the things that I had in my life, even up to the age of nine, I just felt like a different person. And all the pain that it inflicted on me, it just kept inflicting it on me. Because if I really was able to really verbalize it, and I was when I finally got to college, years later, I could say, you owed me to be a dad to me. You owed my mother to be a husband to her. You owed my sister to be the father that she needed in the house. You owed it to my grandmother to be there. You owed it to not leave. You owed this. You owed that. And I went through a whole litany of things that he owed. And I realized that every one of those things was in my heart. Everything he owed me was there. And every way I was thinking toward him was based on the debt that he owed. And he could not repay it. The damage was done. The heartbreak was there. Lawlessness abounded and love grew cold. And you better believe that my love was cold to him. There was no love. There was no respect. There was no anything other than contempt. And all the while, I was the one being tortured. I was the one. Because the unforgiveness in my heart kept me in a perpetual state of being a victim. It continued to inflict pain, fear, contempt, anger. I didn't trust. I told my wife when we were dating, I know you're going to leave me. My mindset, what did she have to do with it? Nothing. That was the way I brain thought. We're getting close as friends when you're ditching me. Because if you're getting close to me, I know it's just a matter of time before you say, no, nope, that's it, we're not friends anymore. Because that's what I was thinking. That was the impact that it had. So why get close? Why open up my heart? Why make myself available? Because lawlessness abounded right here. Love grew cold. And some of you on this Mother's Day, you may have mothers that you say, they weren't the best moms. I've had people call me when I used to do the radio show and say, you know, Mother's Day and Father's Day aren't the best days. Because there's so much hurt. Sin will continue to produce the ugly fruits that it does until we forgive and Christ removes the plants of unrighteousness within us. You've been given such grace. We've been given such riches. Do you have anything as you sit here today that you say, I've just learned to live with it? Because I'm telling you, I live with it a long time. And you know, funny things are, you can have these big occasions in your life where you're like, man, that was just wrong. And then you know what happens? In other relationships, it's never a big thing. It's just the little torts. Just a little thing here. And you just don't forgive it, but you don't, you just try not to deal with it or think about it. Boom, there's another one, and another, and another, and another. And before you know it, your whole relationship is built on all this little case that you've made. You've built a case against a person that's found in all these little points. And you know, the terrible thing is that you get upset with them because of what wrongs they've done. 
that are unrepented of, that are, they never ask for forgiveness for. But the one who's being tortured is you. What are you doing with those in your relationships today? Are you treating somebody with the Lord's mercies are new every morning? Or are you treating somebody according to all the little sins? My friends, we must forgive. Acknowledge what the debt is. You didn't talk to me very nicely. That was rude the way you treated me. Maybe it was. Okay. Forgiven. You don't even have to say anything. You can just say, Father, help me to forgive it. Take it away. Father, I forgive them. They know not what they do. It's okay. I, I remove it. How do you know if you have? Because you don't start treating them according to that sin. You treat them according to the grace of the Lord. It's a really easy litmus test to know. Are you treating somebody with the grace of God? Or are you treating somebody with the anger of their sin? Our relationships, we should see what's coming out of our hearts. Because when we talk about overcoming sin which is where we started this, and addressing how we have these chinks in our armor, how we have this brokenheartedness that often can prevent it. Friends, how can we be seeking to overcome sin in our lives when we don't let go of the sins that somebody has done against us that we need to remove? It's the very fruit of holding that sin that is probably creating the problem. So much of sin is born out of sin. It's the sins that are in our flesh, sins that have been done against us that we hold on to and we're reacting to sin as opposed to acting in the grace of Jesus. So what I'm asking you to do is to take an inventory in your heart here and say, am I doing this thing? Am I holding against somebody else? Because friends, I can tell you this. Everything we talked about overcoming with the word of God, everything we talked about overcoming by knowing and believing our identity in Christ, everything we've talked about overcoming by prayer and speaking the word and the Lord rebuke you and fellowship and taking one day at a time. You know, we can talk about all these ways that God has shown us how to overcome sin, but they all get short-circuited right here if we don't accept the authority of God, if we don't accept the forgiveness from God, and if we don't forgive others Friends, we have not made progress unless we have forgiven. He says, you come to bring an offering? You know somebody has something against you? Go be reconciled and then offer your gift. Free the person. Free yourself. So that you can treat people in the way. John wrote something so profound. He said, how can we love God whom we haven't seen if we can't love our brother who we do see? Your closest brother is your spouse or your friend or your mother or your father or your brother. You know who your closest neighbors are, your closest brothers. So friends, for us to be in a place for the work of the Spirit, we must receive of God's grace, but then we must pass it on. There is such a powerful, beautiful flow of God's spirit to come into us to cleanse us so that we can push cleansing and grace out to somebody else. Now, if you're here today and you said, you know what, I am still living and treating people according to this, and I'm, I've wanted to forgive, but I can't. feels like I can't. Maybe today is a day when you need prayer and just ask God to, to help you forgive. Because one of the amazing things about God, when his children come asking for good things, he loves to pour out his spirit to meet the need of somebody who really wants to be set free. The number of times in my life that I can witness and testify that I have had difficulty forgiving, that I have had difficulty letting go of sin, that I've needed a refreshment that I needed my heart towards somebody to be fresh 
to be new with the mercies of the Lord. And I struggled. Friends, it's God who gives us the strength and the power. It's God who does to say, I don't need explanation anymore. I don't hold the debt. It's gone. My heart toward you is pure. And everything in this walk, if we are going to be following Christ, we need to always be in a state where we are under grace. Where sin does not have dominion in our thinking toward one another, but where grace is what is having dominion. That the grace of Jesus Christ that has come to us, that has set us free, is believed and accepted. And the grace that has come to us is willingly, generously, happily shared. Friends, there are things that will happen in your life that will tear your heart apart. I cannot keep you from that. It will come. And we must, through many trials and tribulations, enter the kingdom of heaven. But we will do it walking in the Spirit and submitting ourselves to him who knows all things, to the righteous judge, Jesus Christ, who will make all things right, and realizing he gave to us so that we could give to one another. I pray that we think about this, and if you need prayer, please come to the front. Be glad to pray for you after services that you would be healed. But now let's praise God for his goodness, for the grace that he's given. Let's worship him in spirit and truth, and let's give God thanks for all the healing he gives into our hearts.